welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, my name is Bob Whitaker, and I'm very pleased today to have as our guest Ula Andreas Underland. In 2015, he opened the Blake Hurdall Recovery Center to provide medication free treatment to those who wanted such treatment or to patients who wanted to taper from their psychiatric drugs. As Mad in America has uh, urged for a paradigm shift in psychiatric care, this is a center that very much embodies that paradigm shift. And we have long considered it as one of the most important initiatives in the Western world. So we're really pleased today to have Ula to tell us about the Recovery Center, its evolution, and some of the struggles it has faced in, in political financial circles. So, Ula, so great to have you here. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you very much, Bob. I'm appreciated to, to be invited to your very important program. So let's go back a, a little bit to the beginning. And, and that is, why did you do this? You know, what was your involvement with the psychiatric world before you started the center? And then what motivated you to take this big leap into uh, such an, uh, an important and daring initiative, I'd say? You know, I had to start a little bit with my background. I, I was raised in a suburb of Oslo, the capital of Norway, uh, close to the largest psychiatric hospital at that time, Dikemark. When I was 16 years old, I started actually to, to work at the kitchen <laughs> in Dikemark. And when I was 18 years old, I was, uh, I was already a father of a, a lovely daughter. And uh, then I educated as a nurse and I... Um, I did uh, different uh, types of jobs in uh, within the Norwegian mainstream psychiatry until uh, 1994. And I worked one and a half year as a sales manager for a pharmaceutical company, actually uh, launching the first SSRIs to the Norwegian markets. So, <laughs> but I, I quit the job after one and a half year, even it was a great commercial success because... Uh, as uh, we all know, the, the, the so-called antidepressant without uh, uh, side effects was a huge uh, bluff. I started up uh, in '97 uh, with my own uh, advisory uh, service. I used, of course, much of my, my knowledge about uh, how, to, how to organize the, the services for people with, uh, with mental problems. And in 2000, I founded my first healthcare company. And uh, when I saw that in uh, seven years later, uh, after a great commercial success, but the most important thing was I, I proved for the, for the municipalities that it was completely possible to make housing for people, for, for people with mental problems also, if they uh, had the behavior problems and 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 abuse pro problems, but you know to have a to have a house uh, which you could think of this is a place I could live myself, and with people with the right uh, attitude, and 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 with uh, with dignity, no matter how big a problem you could have had from earlier on it was possible to to have a, a dignified uh, housing and this is uh, actually a very big success in Norway many of the municipalities today has very very good housing for for people with with uh, uh, chronic uh, mental disorders at uh, this time I was reckoned to be a a quite a successful health entrepreneur in Norway. So in, in 2007, I founded the, this company. And uh, in 2013, I met uh, the leader of the, yeah, the most uh, profiled uh, patients organization in Norway uh, called the White Eagle, uh, Jan Magnus Sørensen, who was a speaker on a, a conference. And he showed some rather <laughs> special papers there telling that schizophrenia patient without medication did have uh, far better recovery rates than the one on medication. And actually, even I'm a psychiatric nurse, my occupation, I've been working within the, uh, the psychiatric area for, for nearly half my life. 
I never heard about it. And uh, I went to see him, and um, he was uh, he was the leader of this uh, this umbrella organization in Norway with the, the, the all the patients organization, having already succeeded in having the Norwegian Parliament to decide that we should have a medication free uh, alternative in Norway. In 2010, they have reached the goal when the parliament decided that this should be a treatment uh, alternative in Norway and, and be a part of the Norwegian psychiatry. But in 2013, no one had started up, even though from the political part of, of you, uh, this was said to be uh, one of the most important things for the psychiatry to do. And uh, so they asked me, uh, they called me back after six months and he, he invited me for, to, to this umbrella organization and said, Ola Andreas, you're a, you're a healthcare entrepreneur. We want you to help us to describe a project, this medication-free uh, hospital, but you have to help us to, to make this uh, look like something that could be launched. And so I did, uh, for free, of course. And this was very, very shocking experience for me because I thought I knew quite a lot uh, when it comes to how to treat people with, with, with mental problems. And I was quite uh, certain that the medication was a very, very important part of it. And I met these people and I had to admit that I had misunderstood a lot of things. And it was quite easy to help them describe this project how with such a recovery-oriented psychiatric hospital look like. I find this so fascinating, the ingredients that went into your making this decision. So here in the United States, we often hear peer groups say, um, housing first. So you had already experienced the housing first benefit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then there was the political change in Norway or the political foundation, which doesn't exist often in other countries. And even that political foundation came from peer uh, politics. Yes, yes. Third, you came in touch with evidence, the Martin Harrow study, that is so convincing, but you had the open mind to actually accept it or believe it could be true rather than resist it, go into that denialism. And then... Uh, you brought with you entrepreneurship, that ability to take a leap. So in other words, what came together from my perspective to create this incredible initiative was a number of very unique factors. At the same time, you can see how they're a foundation for real change. So it demonstrates also how difficult it is for for the patients' organization within uh, the field of psychiatry to to dare to <laughs> suggest something. Because when I said, okay, it's clear for me that we have to make a recovery-oriented uh, hospital. And if we go for a recovery-oriented hospital, half of the staff should have lived experience. Wow! <laughs> the, the biggest organization in this umbrella group said, then they will think we are mad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we had some discussion, and uh, today we can laugh about it, but it's obvious. Just to be clear about this, you involve the peer uh, groups with the design of the place, and then once you opened it with the staffing the place. So they were, they were part and parcel of this, creating this initiative. First of all, I helped them because um, uh, this organization was going to show the, the health department of Norway, this is the, the hospital we want. We want it recovery oriented. We want to have a medication free treatment and we have to organize uh, in, in this uh, way within the framework of the, the legal system of Norway. And, and my, my job was done by that. This was in 2013. And then uh, I was asked by another uh, large psychiatric hospital one year later uh, if I could help them with uh, five very um, chronic Ill, uh, Ill uh, psychiatric patients who has been hospitalized for 10, 15 years, if I could make some effort to help them get out of the hospital. And then, of course, being an entrepreneur, I... I thought, okay, here we have to establish 
a psychiatric hospital. In the beginning, all of these patients were on forced treatment. But then I, 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 um, I uh, made an uh, application for the health authorities to have us um, be certified as a, hos- a psychiatric hospital. And then I used <laughs> the project from this uh, umbrella organization. I used the project because nothing, nothing had happened <laughs> still. So I, I made this hospital and the, the project was designed by the largest users organizations in Norway. So it's no 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 um, wonder how is <laughs> it is it worked. Yeah, doing this uh, startup, um, we had to to work a lot uh, as role models because very many of the the other nurse this, the other staff had all their experience from the mainstream psychiatry. To work recovery oriented, you have to work in a completely different way. But it was a success from day one. Tell us what happened to those first five patients. The first five patients on forced treatment they wanted to send to you. It was a great success. The first lady, she became a celebrity in Norway. Actually, it was made to documentary on on radio of her life. And, and and all of them actually are today living uh, by themselves, actually. All five? Yeah, all five of them, all five of them. And none of them stayed uh, in, uh, in our hospital for more than uh, half a year. And it was so disturbing for me to understand how important the empowerment was. Asking uh, the first lady, what do you really want of your life? And, and uh, she told me what she wanted and, uh, and she achieved her goals. But it's, it's so disturbing to know that she's been hospitalized since she was 18 years old and never, never uh, been listened to uh, and never been asked this simple question. <laughs> what kind of life do you want to live? Tell us about their use of medication when they came to you. How did that change? They were put on the ordinary uh, kind of medication. This specific lady, she was uh, antipsychotic. Uh, she uh, had uh, gained uh, nearly 100 kilogram uh, for these uh, last 10 years. And she had a lot of uh, side effects, of course, of this uh, obesity. She was not in the need of, of, of antipsychotic. Uh, that was... First, a decision, decision from from her her uh, first hospital, but uh, uh, you know the anxiety and 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 the the bad feelings uh, or everything uh, this disappears when you are having a life and, and and something happening in life. And this lady, this lovely lady, she had a fantastic family. But they didn't uh, believe in, uh, in, in the system of the hospital, and she didn't believe in it. And I, I, it took me three months to, to, to make her b- believe that, we, uh, th- that she could trust us. But when she trusted us, the problem was no longer, longer existing. And, and she, of course, she has some behavioral problems, but um, still... This was seven years ago, and she is. I am still the one <laughs> she calls when there is something difficult in life, and and and, and this is the way it should be. If you trust something, someone, and and you have got uh, proper help, then you will continue to call uh, the person. Of course, I will. Uh, I still answer uh, answer her. That was the first person that also had such a fantastic uh, response to to this uh, recovery oriented way that that the hospital where she was uh, where she had been for 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 fifteen years. Uh, I remember this uh, chief psychologist. He, he couldn't believe it what he saw, and she was he, she was also on forced treatment, and she was taken off forced treatment for the first time in fifteen years. Wow. With these initial five, did the treatment involve tapering them from from their medications or tapering down? Was that since this was part of the initiative? Yeah, tapering down. 
was part of it, uh, not for everyone. Uh, I think it's more like the results we have today. That's seventy yeah, percent of our patients have an issue with medication. Uh, for these patients, they were so uh, hospitalized, so so uh, chronic hospitalized that, that they didn't know a life <laughs> without medication. But when you see the patient don't have the energy to 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 live her own life in an apartment, of course you have to look at the medication. She had some more or less a chronic uh, psychotic way of looking of life. But for her, as it was for many other people, I think you have to learn to live with. And the medication didn't do, uh, do any, any good to these symptoms. It, it gave her uh, 100 kilogram uh, of extra weight, but nothing happened to the, to the psychosis, to her psychosis. So tell us, you're a private hospital within a public health system. So how do you, you have these first five patients that were recommended to you by or referred to you by other hospitals? So how do patients come to you? And are they all Norwegian or, you, or you have you had some people come from other countries as well? Mainly we have uh, had uh, patients from Norway, but we have been contacted. Uh, we have had patients from, from Sweden and we have some, some patients uh, calling us from, uh, from the US and also from Germany and Denmark, UK. We have had as a principle, we, we don't uh, take private paying patients. Uh, we are 100% publicly financed today. Uh, having patients from from other hospitals in Norway, and and having the, the the public foundation, so we haven't opened up for for private paying patients. That's uh, also a, a statement we took because uh, what we uh, also have been doing is to 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 establish this foundation to to make this being a. Uh, part of the, the public system of Norway uh, and, uh, and so that there will be no discussion about uh, uh, profit and uh, earning money. As I, as I know, there are no other uh, psychiatric hospitals, ordinary psychiatric hospital, because we are an ordinary psychiatric hospital within the framework of the Norwegian uh, legal system uh, and health system. So, so we have the same numbers of nurses, psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and we, we follow the same rules. But still, <laughs> we offer something special because we offer a recovery-oriented, medication-free uh, treatment program. I don't think there is another hospital of the world doing the same thing. No, I don't either. So tell us what a day is like there for patients. You know, what is the treatment program like? You, you've mentioned how it's empowering. You ask, what do they want with their lives? So if I'm a patient and let's say I've had a psychotic episode, what is it like when I come to your hospital? Yeah, the, the treatment consists of, of three pillars. It's the, the, the IMR, also the illness management and recovery. That's five days a week, one and a half to two hours, every day, except from the weekends. And then it's the, the high intensity training, uh, five days a week. People should know it's physical training. It's exercise. Physical training, high intensity training. Yeah, that, because it, it, it addresses your heart. Uh, and, and then it's uh, what we call a healthy diet from our excellent chefs. And we have the best restaurant <laughs> north of Oslo. And, 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 uh, and we do take uh, all kinds of diets and things like that. But of course, within an environment where you have uh, everything what uh, the human mankind uh, would like to have, uh, clean air, nice view, a forest, nice lake, and, and the most important thing, people, nice people with the right attitude. And of course, half of the staff have lived experience and know, uh, know about uh, how, how this uh, problem you have, uh, how this is uh, possible to, to live with and how to deal with it. How many patients in your hospital at any one time? We have actually two uh, hospitals uh, in Hurdal uh, with altogether 60 patients. Are you often at, at full capacity? We have only had the full capacity for yeah, nearly three, three years. So half the staff is uh, 
people with lived experience. You obviously have psychiatrists working with you to help you with the drug uh, tapering and all. How do the psychiatrists respond to this environment that's so different than the usual environment they may have known? <laughs> um, that's one of the most uh, important findings, I think, because if you are running a psychiatric hospital in Norway, you have this, uh, this um, system, you have to have an, an, uh, the most important guy <laughs> in the, within the psychiatric hospital is the psychiatrist, of course. And it was almost impossible to find, but I found one. He was the only uh, psychiatrist, he was also a politician, who dared to to start up working with us. And um, it's a strong word to say dare to, but but that's the truth. They, the psychiatrist who dared to start to work in a medication-free uh, offering a hospital has uh, really have had a tough time. And this was the situation until two years ago when we had this uh, large documentary on, on the, uh, the, the biggest Norwegian uh, television station where we had this one-hour program uh, f- showing Nor- Norwegian and uh, Norwegian people what's, how a psychiatric hospital could be. And, and today we have no problems uh, having a very good, uh, very clever, uh, young and old uh, psychiatrists uh, working with us. We have actually a waiting list of psychiatrists wanting to work to us. So, so today, we have a, we, we recruit uh, better psychiatrists than mainstream do, and and the reason is obvious. They love to see the patient. <laughs> uh, being satisfied, and of course, everyone wants to work with with, with within a system that that gives uh, satisfied patients. Of course, it's obvious. So today, this is this is uh, this is not a problem, but it was uh, was the biggest problem for the first year, and it was obvious that the psychiatrist and the union uh, of psychiatrists in Norway were sabotaging this. Uh, medication-free system, very much. The first uh, conference uh, where I was asked to give a a review of one-year experience, uh, the organizer of this this, uh, conference said, Ola Andreas, I have to to take you over the program because uh, the the, the board of specialists, they say that... (laughs) They will leave <laughs> if I let you <laughs> talk. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a strong lobby. But today there is no problem, and to have uh, nurses and psychologists has never been a problem. And but 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 psychiatrists today, uh, I have a psychiatrist seventy years old. I a psychiatrist uh, close to thirty. So and 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 I, people with the, from different countries coming to to our hospital to learn how to work uh, recovery oriented and and uh, and uh, medication free, and they get to have relationships with the patients. Obviously, by they have personal relationships which you don't often see in ordinary hospitals. That's uh, that's of course in our hospital the patients tells us what he wants us to help him with. He sets the goals. It's not always obvious, and it's not always the same goal for the whole period. But this is a game changer. This is really a game changer. And of course, we have a we have people with different different uh, different competence. This is very important, of course, to have both psychologists and psychiatrists and nurses and and but also I, I know the most important thing: people with lived experience. The oldest uh, psychiatrist uh, who's been working in the mainstream psychiatry in Norway for a, for a, yeah for a, as long as he's lived, he said, "It's so tragic tragic uh, to see how little impact <laughs> the psychiatrist <laughs> actually have in, in the recovery process of a patient." And I think that's a very strong statement, but. This is uh, exactly what it's all about. It's not us. It's not my uh, uh, knowledge. It's 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 how to help the patient learn to live with with uh, his or her health problem. How would you describe your patients that have been through 
come to you? In other words, you get very many first episode patients, or are you mostly getting patients who've sort of failed in the conventional system? How would you describe the people who've come to you as a group, as a cohort? I will say 80%, 90% of the patients coming to us is patients who have uh, tried the, 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 the mainstream psychiatry earlier. Most of them have. And most of them have very tragic uh, experiences, I must say. Many of them have been tra- traumatized uh, by by forced treatment and and especially uh, by for- forced uh, medication. And I think the first twenty patients we had were given us uh, not the first five because they really believed that we could help them and we did. But we have had patients that were that then the system they came from never believed <laughs> we could help them. And and uh, as you know, we we also have an approval for forced treatment. We have a we have a, a, a we have beds for fixation, which is is uh, something you you have to have when you have um, should have uh, patients on forced treatment. And and we decided to have this uh, this uh, approval because then patient on uh, forced treatment from other hospitals could come to our hospital. And, and and so we have had a, a, a lot of patients on forced treatment who came to, to our hospital. And in eight years, we have not have any, not a single complaint uh, on, on the use of forced treatment. Never, never. And, and that was the main uh, argument for medication-free uh, uh, tr- treatment uh, by the by the uses organizations and the department. If we, we will f- get rid of the forced treatment, we have to give page, patients something that they believe in and an alternative to medication. When they're under a forced treatment order and they come to you, that doesn't mean you're necessarily forcing medication on them. They're, they're part of your treatment system. They have to be there, but that treatment can involve not giving them medication or tapering for medication. Is that correct? Yeah, of course. We, even if you are in uh, on, on forced treatment, all the first five patients were on forced treatment. But if the patient believe in you and in the system and agree in what's happening, of course you don't need to force, uh, force her or him. It's obvious. <laughs> well, it does seem obvious, but it's not how the rest of the world works, unfortunately. The conventional treatment doesn't work that way. No, it, it, it's not. And, and, uh, and, and of course, this is why our eight years experience are so important. Because in Norway, we have a very, very high uh, numbers of, of patients being treated by, by force. And and uh, the last numbers came uh, one month ago. It was exactly the same numbers. The, the, the reason is why is because the system, the mainstream psychiatry, do as they always have done. I I I, I was so naive that I thought that this this history, this first personal histories were, were told would make a, an impact. But after some years, I, I, I understood that these histories had been told to, to psychiatrists for decades, having no effect at all. So let's talk about your outcomes. Start with your experience with tapering people on medications, because what the conventional wisdom is, you can't do that. People go crazy. Uh, they become psychotic again. You really can't taper people from the medication. So tell us about what you've learned, A, about what can be done, and B, what is the best way to do it? What we have learned uh, from these 650 patients is that there is uh, the metabolism and the reaction, the responding of medication is very, very individual. And And again, you have to listen very, very carefully to what the patient tells you. And remember, I'm I'm not a psychiatrist. I I I am a I'm a trained nurse, and and of course this is the this is the psychiatrist who are helping the patient with the tapering and the system. But I've, I I know this by the results we 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 look at that 
uh, all these um, patients we have had uh, through our hospital, uh, most of them for about four months, 80% of them say they are very satisfied with the, with the, with the treatment program. And, and 70% of all uh, these patients, they want to reduce or to stop using uh, psychopharmaceuticals. 70% say they want to, and are they successful? 80% of these patients meet their personal goals of reducing or phasing out pharmaceuticals altogether. 80% of them. But phasing out drugs is very demanding for, for, for many and, and has to be customized because... Some patients will respond v with with quite heavy side effects, even if the dosage is 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 uh, taking down very little. Uh, we see that especially on uh, antidepressant, uh, that uh, these psychoactive substances are very very tough to reduce uh, for for some patients. But some other patients can reduce it without having a, having any problems at all. But you know, uh, the, the most important achievement we made when it comes to medication was that for four years ago, uh, we had for, for the first time in this, this book of medication that the doctors use, uh, you have this olanzapine, the most uh, common used uh, antipsychotic in Norway. It was uh, written there uh, that the time period you have to use to lower the dosage. And, and that was quite shocking for very many <laughs> because it, it says on an on a ordinary dosage of olanzapine, it's recommended to use two years to, to reduce uh, uh, not having a rebound psychosis. And you know the story about <clears throat> being psychotic, using antipsychotic to stay uh, without psychosis. And, and uh, we know that today that uh, the side effects of these medications are so severe to very many that they will uh, rather uh, flee the country than to, to, uh, to go on them. So if I interviewed many of your patients who had you know, said they were satisfied, the 80% who said they were satisfied, what would they say was the reason for their satisf satisfaction? What would they say happened to them at your place? In what way were their lives transformed? What they tell us is that for the first time, they were, were asked a question, what kind of help do you want? And they, they meet humble people. Even the psychiatrist is humble, asking uh, the very same question, what can I do for you? Of course, having an environment not looking like a psychiatric hospital. We have visitors from all over the world all the time. We have students, people from yeah, from the municipality. Everyone's coming visiting us. Politicians and and uh, yeah, all kinds of professionals, except from <laughs> psychiatrists from the mainstream. <laughs> and and this makes a, a environment where the patient doesn't think this is a place where I get a stigma. And it's something completely different from what they have experienced from other hospitals. Uh, we have open uh, doors and we have uh, excellent food. Yeah, it's uh, it's like being in a in a resort. And, but the most important thing is make their own uh, personal service plan, as I call them, a program which I use the next time I have a crisis. I will not end up at the hospital. My vision of a psychiatric hospital, we have to, to be, like Mr. Peter Bregan said, a loving, caring haven. We have to be a place where the patient loves to come because he knows we will give you this loving, caring haven. And, and this, is, this is what we, what we have achieved. And I would say we are not a single special person within our system, but we have a system that has a very, very a strong um, model of how we treat people, recovery-oriented. And, and to, to make this a success, it's to have people with lived experience. And this is what they tell, tell us. 
I can attest having been to your place on Lake Hurdle. It's a very pleasant place to be and the food was excellent. And a quick question on this. Have you published, thought of publishing any outcomes? For, so from my perspective, it'd be great to see if others adopted your model in other countries, that sort of thing. This could be really an initiative that spread, so to speak. So have you published your outcomes of satisfaction? What is happening to people in, in, in a research sense? We, we haven't uh, done too much on that. We have done some research when it comes to the, the treatment of IMR and, and the, the high-intensity training. We, so we have done some research on this. Our psychiatrists and our, our, our staff are asked to give uh, speeches and, and uh, talk about our results. But uh, what I really are, are uh, hoping for is that we could have some funding when it comes to, to, to do research, to, to, to do it the same way they do it in the mainstream psychiatry. But satisfy customers is uh, the number one. If, you, if you're running a restaurant or a, or a hospital, <laughs> satisfied customers. And, and of course, not using, <laughs> have to, not to have uh, to use forced treatment. So let's talk about your future now in a way that you, you can see you've had eight, you made this happen. You have eight years of doing it. You have a satisfaction rate of 80%. You have people that are able to get down to their use of medication in the way they would like it. So it would seem that you were primed to continue. Uh, you just had an article in a newspaper where the uh, local newspaper, the individual said, going to this place saved my life. You can't get better PR than that. But what is your future within the Norwegian system? Is it precarious now? I think when I was there, you had two settings. You had a smaller setting that was more hospital-like, and then you had the place that was more camp-like, in fact. Are both still open? And, and where are you at in terms of moving towards the future? We have had a lot of political attention. Everyone was visiting us because satisfied patients within the psychiatry is quite sensational also in Norway. And everyone was talking about how important it is to have this recovery-oriented medication-free treatment program. But the fact is that um, one month ago, we, we closed down the, the, the latest of our two clinics. So today we have 30 beds. And the reason is why uh, we have been um, subsidizing the, the, the running of the hospital quite uh, heavily since... Uh, since the last year, especially after the election, because the mainstream psychiatry uh, have um, have uh, convinced the politicians in charge that uh, they don't need us, uh, and uh, that uh, the the main uh, financial system uh, uh, letting people come to us was launched by the Conservative Party, and it's been a quite a success for for uh, eight years. But the Labour Party, who now are in charge, they are uh, against this, uh, this uh, financing system. But the problem is that without this financing system, uh, we will not have uh, patients because then uh, the public uh, system will take care of them. Even though the, there are uh, a lot of uh, problems, uh, capacity problems within the public system, they are now uh, hoping that we will uh, give up. So we are now struggling uh, and, uh, and really are trying to stay and uh, to, to uh, resolve our... our um, psychiatrists and psychologists and staff, of course, but without any any agreement for, with, with the, the public system, we'll uh, have to close down in uh, four months. So two questions. What can the, the user groups in Norway do to try to help keep you alive, number one? And I have a second question. What can be done from say our listeners, because from Mad in America's point of view and our listeners' point of view, uh, your hospital, your initiative is a model for what is possible and for a paradigm shift that we've all been urging or advocating for. And you had the support, I believe, you know, Danius Perus or someone from his office at the United Nations for 
Special Rapporteur for Health visited, saw you as a, an example of a new way forward. I believe the World Health Organization, when in its report, also cited you as a as a, a an example of a way forward, so much better than the, the, the current model. So two parts question, Ulay. One, what can Norwegian user groups do or people do to try to help you survive? And then what can be done from you know, those on the outside who want to see a, a change? I think we have to we have to to raise our voices, and I, I think the politicians know uh, they know the importance because when they have been visiting us, the only problem uh, for the politicians in Norway is, is that this is a commercial uh, company running it. The importance of, of uh, the, this um, recovery oriented hospital is dramatically because without uh, Lake Hurdal Recovery Center, you have. Absolutely no, uh, not a hospital in the world running in the way that the patients want it. And of course, what we have noticed the last year, we have had a massive campaign from one newspaper uh, telling uh, uh, every every kind of, of uh, lies about us. We have had one suicide uh, in our hospital for eight years. Every year... Some, something between 200 and 250 patients commit suicide while being hospitalized in Norwegian psychiatry. And this is uh, the numbers we, we know uh, for well. We, we, we have 80% satisfied uh, patients. We have, uh, in these eight years, we have, have five complaints, p- patients uh, uh, complaining, and they were complaining because we wouldn't prolong their stays in our hospital. But this massive campaign tells me, tells me that someone out there are so keen on uh, trying to tell uh, this is wrong. And, you know, that's because someone are very afraid of us. Today, uh, you have to listen to the patients. We have to, if we will be able to change the system, Uh, It will not be changed by the old system. The old system have had 12 years where they could have uh, made this happen in their own hospital. But they don't don't want to because they they are uh, still living in in this this old paradigm. And of course, the necessary changes in psychiatry will, will, will be driven by satisfied patients. And the only hospital of the world with satisfied patients uh, couldn't be turned down. So I, I, I really need help from, from both Norwegian users organization and internationally, as I think the UN and, and the WHO, uh, they, have to, they have to say this, this uh, project in Norway uh, should be available uh, internationally. Yeah, then I could, of course, start up somewhere else. But why do so? Because we have used eight years of, uh, of, of uh, work uh, uh, and, and um, made this uh, pilot uh, happen and proven that this is possible within uh, the, the, an ordinary legal framework. You know, it reminds me of a project that was done in the 1970s in the United States called the Soteria Project, which was led by... Lauren Mosher, who was, uh, you know, his head of schizophrenia studies at the National Institute of Mental Health, he proved that it worked. It was run as an experiment. They ran it for 10 years. It worked. It produced better outcomes, was cost effective, and was built around a lot of the same principles of listening to the people, what do they want, the clients, patients they want, housing, empowerment. They could use medications according to how they thought was, you know, sort of customized use. So it worked. And then... American psychiatry crushed it. And that was a real, you know, you talk about the where the path in the woods splits historically. So that's when this sort of a way of approach was crushed. And we went down this biological model, drugs, drugs, drugs. And now I see your hospital, your initiative, sort of the a replication of that time where there's a road, it's splitting. <laughs> And the question is, are we going to keep open that other pathway that you pioneered here, which is, it is, it does bring up echoes of the Soteria project. So all I can say is I hope that there can be political power put to pressure put on the Norwegian government to keep 
your initiative alive because I think it's so important for not just Norway, but everybody that wants to see a different paradigm emerge. Yeah, I completely agree. But I must say that uh, the, the forces against us are very, very powerful, very powerful. And of course, uh, the good forces of, of uh, our hospital and 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 uh, what we have achieved uh, after these eight years is is very very important for so many people. But you know, uh, the 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 patients uh, suffering from mental problems are 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 different from the patient suffering from heart diseases or cancer they they, they don't have this uh, this uh, feeling of stigma they are much bolder they they are much stronger lobby but this is very very important and and if you look at the at the fact the numbers of forced treatment treated patients in Norway are exactly the same numbers 12 years after this decision of, uh, of having medication free treatment program we 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 don't have had a, we haven't had any single one single complaint being used used of forced treatment in our hospital so it proved that the patients organization were uh, completely right to reduce the, the 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 use of forced treatment you have to to provide patients a, a treatment system which they believe in and which respect them also when it comes to medication. If I don't want to use medication, I I should have another uh, possibility. And the IMR is, of course, also for people wanting to use medication, but also for people who don't want to use medication. But we have to listen to the patient and to to kill <laughs> the the only hospital uh, on the face of earth doing this uh, in 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 the way both the UN and the WHO uh, want. It, it's a very stupid thing because what we were planning when you were visiting us was to to start up an international uh, center because we think this it's better for people to come to our system and uh, to our hospital and 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 to learn uh, to teach other how to do it in their own countries I, i'm quite shocked when when uh, when we are in this situation uh, at uh, at the beginning of this uh, this new year but we will we will struggle and we will fight but we will need we will be, we'll be need uh, every support we can have both in norway and internationally Ulla, thanks for that. And thanks for your time today. I think you've summed it up, uh, what is at stake so well here. There's a lot at stake for the people of Norway, but there's a lot at stake internationally as well. And somehow we have to keep this hope alive. So thank you for your time. Thank you for this uh, beautiful summation of what you do here and the sort of the philosophy that governs you. I wish we had a hundred such hospitals all over the world. We will. Let's hope so. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.